Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us bright and early on this Saturday morning. Uh, hope you all had some good rest last night and are excited for the day ahead. Give me a thumbs up if all of you are excited for day two of the Conscious Woman Summit. All right. Now we had some great conversations yesterday around conscious leading and today we are entirely focused on conscious living and that is something that is really important to us at Genomics because let's be honest we are holistic beings we cannot compartmentalize our professional lives and personal lives and say I will live by one set of values in my professional life and another set of values in my personal life how do we really integrate all parts of ourselves consciously? How do you live with greater awareness? That's what we want to talk about today. And to that end, we have curated a great set of experiences for all of you, which includes two incredibly relevant panel discussions, one on conscious, conscious consumption to talk about how we can consume in a way that is kind to us and is kind to the environment. And true to that spirit, again, I am wearing something that has been made from an upcycled sari. I am still on my shopping fast, two years and counting uh, as, as my part to do something um, for the planet. And we have another panel discussion on conscious parenting because we all know parenting has been quite a challenge for all of us in the last uh, two years or so. So let's talk about how can we parent in a way that supports our highest growth, yes, but also allows our children to thrive. How can parenting become a vehicle for both healing and growth? We also have two amazing conscious pauses today, just like we did yesterday, because we do want to continue to give you all a chance to nourish yourself in a meaningful way and take care of yourself physically and emotionally. So today we have Namrita Sudindra, who is a yoga practitioner, who's going to be taking us through taking us uh, through some exercises involving our breath. So we're going to do some breath work. And Radhika Jan, uh, who's an expressive arts therapist, is going to be taking you through an emotionally enriching experience using creative arts. So lots to look forward to today. And finally, of course, at the end of the day, yours truly, I will be doing a workshop on how you can build courage and compassion. Because as Shraddha, our keynote speaker, said yesterday morning, compassion is difficult for a lot of us, but if we can really build that strong foundation of self-compassion, so much becomes possible for us. We can then just step out into the world, go after all our dreams with so much more confidence and really go out there and make the impact, the biggest impact that we can possibly make, which I know is very important to many, many of you, which is why you are here today. All right, but first we are going to kick this day off with an incredibly special person. It gives me such great joy to introduce our keynote speaker, for today to you. I have been following his work for almost 10 years now, and his ideas have helped me immensely in my own journey to live and lead more consciously. In fact, if any of you ever watch my Mindful Monday videos, uh, many of them are inspired by Dr. Rao's ideas. So I am sure they will help you as well. Professor Shrikumar Rao is an internationally renowned speaker, best-selling author, and one of the most popular MBA lecturers in the US. In fact, uh, listen to this, his courses are among the highest rated of many of the world's top business schools, including Columbia University, the London Business School, and the London Business School. In fact, his courses are so popular, there, there's sometimes a waiting list of over a year just to get in. 
that's how uh, that's how much in demand his courses are. He regularly consults with senior executives and entrepreneurs from leading organizations like Google, Microsoft, IBM, you name it, and many, many more in areas like meaning, purpose, performance, and leadership. These are some of the things he talks about frequently. He also regularly contributes to publications like Forbes, Inc.com, CEO.com, and his perspectives on business strategy, and not just business strategy, strategy, but the spiritual dimensions of business strategy and success are widely sought across all media channels. So one thing I will say before we bring him on, we did try our level best to bring Dr. Rao to you live. However, given his travel schedule, it just was not possible. He's actually on Pacific time right now, visiting his daughter who just had a baby. So we had to pre-record this session earlier, but please know that he has done this just for all of you. So I do hope you get a lot out of this session and without further ado here's dr rao to talk to all us all of us about how we can rewire our mind not just for resilience but as he says extreme resilience so let's bring on dr rao hello everybody I am here to help you rewire your mind to cultivate extreme resilience. Now, resilience, of course, is your ability to bounce back from adversity. And extreme resilience is where you bounce back so fast that an external observer might not even know that you had suffered an adversity. And extreme resilience, of course, is a lot better than just plain old-fashioned resilience. So that's good enough as it is. But actually, I'm going to go beyond that. Not only am I going to show you how you can rewire your mind to cultivate extreme resilience, I'm also going to show you how you can eradicate stress and how you can let joy into your life. Most of us go through life and we have an undercurrent of tension that never leaves us. And we don't recognize how debilitating it is. And I'm going to show you how you can let joy really flood into your life. Okay, let's begin. That's me and those are my two books. And if you order them right away from Amazon, my publisher will be very happy. I'd like you to start thinking about your ideal life. And most of us think that our ideal life has to do with the circumstances that surround us. You know, what kind of job we do, how much money we make, how deep the carpeting in our office is, what kind of person our colleagues are. And uh, if we think in terms of, well, I need to have relaxing, we think in terms of what you're doing, like this gentleman is out on the beach. And I want to throw out for you to consider that what makes your life wonderful is not what you're doing, it is how you are feeling. So in my book, you are a tremendous success, not based upon how many toys you've accumulated, But when you get up in the morning, do you feel radiantly alive? As you go through the day, do you have this deep feeling that you're doing exactly what it is that you're supposed to be? You're in the right place at the right time, and you always have been. And you could almost fall to your knees in involuntary gratitude at the tremendous good fortune that has been bestowed on you. If that is your experience of life, you are a success. If that is not, we have some ways to go. Now, all of this requires you to make a quantum leap in your life, and you cannot make a quantum leap by working harder, by working smarter, or managing your time better. Typically, when you go to a coach or you go to somebody who is going to help you get more out of life, those are the three buckets that uh, uh, their recommendations come in. You've got to work harder. You you know, you're working too hard. You've got to work smarter or you have to manage your time better. And I'm suggesting that these are not the answers. Working harder can actually set you back. Working smarter has limited payoff. Managing your time better is a lot more difficult than you think it is, and it does not solve the problem. 
the only way you can make a quantum leap in your life is by thinking differently. The notion of thinking differently is not new to you. You've been exposed to it many times. I'm sure you've all been told that uh, uh, you should think of the glass as half full rather than half empty, that uh, every problem is an opportunity in disguise. So yes, you are aware that thinking different, differently is a wonderful thing, but despite that, most of us have difficulty in consistently thinking differently. And that's because we try to think differently by trying to think differently. It doesn't work. What I'm going to share with you today is a method of examining the mental models you have that cause you to view the world in a particular manner. And as you make changes in that, you literally become a different person and you think and behave differently, naturally and organically. Take an example. We all know that when Swami Vivekananda spoke of the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893, his talk was a huge surprise. But even before he delivered his talk, he had the entire audience up and applauding. And that is an applause that lasted many minutes. Typically, in a formal occasion like that, the speaker would get up and acknowledge the chairman, the various speakers, and uh, so on, and express how delighted he was to be speaking to such an august gathering. Swami Vivekananda spoke from his heart, and he simply said, my brothers and sisters in America. And that was so unusual, so much from the heart, that the audience, as I said, gave him a standing ovation that lasted several minutes, and from then on, he went on to become a star of that conference. Now, if you look at your life, you probably don't think of your life in that way, but I'm now encouraging you to think of it in this way. Your entire life has been nothing but an attempt to exert control over some part of your internal, external environment, everything you do. Did you get married? Well, you got married because you saw this person and you were attracted to him or her. And you thought, if I get married, there's going to be love, companionship, great sex, etc. Let's do it. It was an attempt to exert control. Do you have children? Well, you felt, if I have children, it will bring joy and meaning to my life. And true, I will have to get up in the middle of the night for a short time. But that's okay, because on balance, it will add tremendously to my life. So you had children. It was an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Everything you do has been nothing but an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. The sad news or the good news is you do not have control. You never had control. You never will have control. The only thing you have is the illusion of control. And the illusion of control, by the way, I'm not knocking it. It's a wonderful thing. That's what makes you get up in the morning. That's what makes you lay plans, execute on those plans. It's wonderful. But use the illusion of control, knowing that it is the illusion of control. And at some point in your life, it will break down. If you use the illusion of control, knowing it's the illusion of control, when it breaks down, you simply say, okay, what do I do next? But if you don't know it is the illusion of control, you go to pieces. Let me give you an example. There was an executive who really disliked a, one of her colleagues, and she tried her level best, mobilized support, and eventually she was able to force her colleague out. And then she relaxed into a job saying, now I get promoted and go places. The colleague she forced out joined a competitor. That competitor made a hostile bid for her company, which succeeded. He became her new boss and promptly fired her. Unexpected stuff happens. It happens all the time. So when you're trying to make a quantum leap, stop trying to control your life. Start working on controlling your experience of life. Here's an example. So, <clears throat> One of, the, one of the participants in my class, she was a senior executive, was going to a restaurant, uh, was at a restaurant, and uh, it was a rather expensive restaurant. The service was really terrible. And all of her uh, fellow guests were annoyed and 
you know, they said, complain to the manager, leave no tape or whatever. And she smiled. And uh, when the dinner was over and everybody moved, she said, you know, I'll join you in a couple of minutes. And then she spoke to the waitress. And all of a sudden, the waitress had a, a wonderful smile on her face. And one of my other students who was also in the group asked her, hey, what did you do? And she said, well, I've uh, eaten at this restaurant many times and the service is normally impeccable. And in fact, I've had the same waitress and she's been wonderful. So something was obviously off today. So I told her, I don't know what is happening in your life, but whatever it is, I hope the situation resolves itself. And I left her an outside steps. So my other students said, boy, that was really nice for you. And uh, my first student said, oh, I wasn't doing it for her. I was doing it to save the kid. So my student said, hey, what do you mean by that? Said, well, look at it this way. Supposing I had done what you suggested, complained to the manager, left a note tape, she'd have gotten even more angry. And uh, when the next customer came, she would have been so angry that she plopped the soup down on the table and it, spoiled, it fell on his suit and uh, <clears throat> created a stain. And he was an investment banker on his way to an important meeting. And that stain bothered him. So he mucked up that meeting and he went home and shouted at his kid. And his kid, that was the final straw for his kid. And he went on to drugs and, you know, his life was basically ruined. And what I'm doing is I'm saving the kid. And my other student burst out laughing. But here is the interesting tidbit from that tale. You never know where the ripple effects of anything that you do spread. So always remember that if the waitress is rude, you have the opportunity to save the kid. And if you play that little game with yourself, you'll be amazed at how many times you react in a much more constructive manner to situations which are troubling you. Here's another one. My son and I were playing mini golf. And in front of us, there was a couple who had a small child. And the small child was all over the place. It hit the ball several times, sent it out of the, out of the mini golf rink, then put it back on. And uh, it soon became apparent to us that not only was the child being obstreperous, but the three of them were only playing with one club, which means that they paid once and uh, three of them were playing it. So we were getting upset until I recognized that we had a choice. We could either get upset and that would ruin our outing at the golf club, or we could simply look at the small boy who was obviously having the time of his life and smile with him. So we chose the latter, and then we went up to them and said, hey, do you guys mind if we play forward? And they said, sure, go ahead, and we did, and that problem receded. Once again, what bothers you is not what is happening, but the story you tell yourself about what is happening, and you can always change the story you tell yourself. Mental chatter is an internal monologue that you have going on in your head all the time. Begins when you get up in the morning, is with you now, is with you throughout the day. And sometimes it's so loud it prevents you from going to sleep. So since it's always been a part of our life, we tend to ignore it, suppress it, work around it. We try to live our life as best we can despite our mental chatter. That's a big mistake. Because we construct our life with our mental chatter. We think we live in a real world. We don't. We live in a construct. All of us are living in the matrix, only this is not a matrix constructed by an alien civilization out to enslave us. It's something we constructed with our mental chatter. And let me demonstrate how important this is by telling you about this second arrow. The second arrow is one of the more important teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha asked his disciple Ananda, Ananda, if an arrow would have hit you in the arm, would it not be very painful? Ananda nodded, yes, Lord, it would be very painful. And if a second arrow would have hit you exactly the first arrow hit, would it not be even more painful? Yes, Lord, it would be even more painful. But then Ananda asked, why then do you shoot the second arrow? Now, that needs a little explanation. So let me tell you a story. There was a woman who was a very good mother. And his son just turned 16 and got his provisional driver's license. One day he comes up to the mother and says, hey, mom, I'm meeting a bunch of friends of mine and I need to take the car. Can I take the car? And the mother said, of course not. You just got your license. Where do you have to go? I'll drop you. And uh, the son says, no, mom, you don't understand. I have to take the car 
and it's very important that you not be there. The mother says, no, uh, if I can't be there, that's fine. There's Uber, there's Lyft, what do you want to take? He said, no, no, you don't understand. I have to be there and I have to take the car and you don't have to be there and you don't understand. It is really important. And the mother says no, but the son begs and pleads and wheedles. And you know how children are. Bit by bit, he wore his mother down. She took promises. You're not going to drink. No, no, I'm not going to drink. You're going to call. Yes, I'm going to call. I'll be back by 10 o'clock. Yes, I'll be back by 10 o'clock. So reluctantly, she gets in the car keys. And the moment he gets the car, he forgets all his promises. He goes off. He doesn't call. He misses curfew. Drinks too much. On the way back, he's a serious accident. And his mother is in the hospital when he's being operated on. When he's built to the recovery room, she dashes home to have a quick shower and change so she can go back to the hospital and a friend calls. And a friend says, what kind of a mother are you? How could you possibly have let him take the car? You're not a mother, you're a murderer. Are you shocked that a friend would say something like this at this juncture? Probably. You'd probably be less shocked if I said it wasn't what a friend told her, it's what she told herself. That is the second arrow. Having a son who's been injured and in the operating room is bad enough. Does it make matters any better to tell yourself that you're not a good mother, that you're a murderer? Of course not. But we do it all the time. The second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. Let me repeat that. The second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. In fact, for most of my coaching clients, and they're all very successful persons, if I could get them to stop at the second arrow, they'd be much better off. By the time they recognize what they're doing, they've already shot the fifth, sixth, and 27th arrows. A mental model is a notion you have that this is the way the world works. And you have dozens of models. You've got a model for how do I bring up my children? How do I find a person to marry? How do I find a job? The problem is not that you have models. The problem is that you don't recognize you have models. You think this is the way the world works, but this is not the way the world works. This is your model of the way the world works. And the more you believe in, the in your model, the more you think that this indeed is the way the world works. And you get caught up in a silo that you've constructed around yourself. And sometimes it's so thick, you can't break it down. Let me illustrate by means of an example. Let's say you're stuck in traffic. You're going for an important meeting. You're stuck in traffic and it's a really hot day and the air conditioning isn't working in your car. And all of a sudden, someone cuts in front of you. What are your feelings towards the driver of that car? Probably exemplified by the woman you see on the slide, shaking your fist, clenching your teeth. You're really pissed off at this person who cut you off. Now, what if I were to tell you that this person who cut you off was a father who'd received news that his son was involved in a serious accident and is desperately trying to get to the hospital with no knowledge of whether or not he'll ever see his son alive again. When you know that, can you feel your anger palpably drain out of you? Probably. You now feel compassion for a fellow human being. Now, the point is, you don't really know whether the guy who cut you off was a distraught father or an inconsiderate jerk. But the bigger point is it really doesn't matter. You have the choice of determining what is the emotional domain you occupy. You had a choice and you made a decision and you never even recognized that you had a choice and made a decision. And the reason you made the particular decision you did is because of the mental chatter you entertain and the mental models that you hold. Let me repeat that. The reason you made the particular decision you did is because of the mental chapter you entertain and the mental models you hold. And the reason this is important is that you face such a juncture in your life dozens of times every day. And in many of those instances, perhaps the majority of those instances, you choose to occupy an emotional domain where you feel drained, anxious, nervous, fearful, and you never recognize that this was a choice you had and a decision you made. So here is an exercise for you. Think of any situation that is troubling you and it's persists. 
What you've done around this situation is you have created a reality. You think it is the reality, but it's not. It's really a reality and you have created it. Come up with an alternate reality and the alternate reality has to be better than the one you're experiencing and something you can possibly, possibly believe. And then start living your life as if your alternate reality were the reality. If you have constructed the alternate reality skillfully, you will tip over into a world where your alternate reality is your new default reality. And since you have picked it to be better than the reality you're exercising, your life will have improved. It's a very powerful exercise. In fact, when I conduct my courses, most of the persons uh, in the course achieve the first major breakthrough with this exercise. If you want full details about this exercise, please get a copy of my book, Are You Ready to Succeed? And uh, all of the fine print and the methods of making this a successful exercise are laid out there. We live in a me-centered universe where we're always concerned about what people are thinking about me. I can answer that question for you. Wondering what people are thinking about you? Relax, they are not thinking about you. We go through life watching the movie of our life. And we think everybody is watching the movie of our life. But they're not. They're watching the movie of their life. And in the movie of their life, you figure as a bit player if you figure at all. And by the way, I can prove that to you. Think of some time when you made a horrible faux pas, you made a, a blooper, and your ears still burn at the thought of that horrible mistake, that embarrassing situation that you were in and that you created. And go back and talk to the people who were there at that time. Most of them will not even recollect or remember what you're talking about. And the ones who do will simply brush it out. Oh, that, no big deal. So you've been torturing yourself for days, months, years over something that nobody else can even recollect. So <clears throat> let me share another story with you. Ancient England, site of a great cathedral being constructed, architect was going to the scene of construction, came across three people, all of whom were doing the exact same thing. There was a big block of stone, they put a smaller block of stone on top of the big block of stone and beat it with a hammer till it broke. And he asked the first one, what are you doing? He said, can you see I'm breaking rocks? Why are you doing it? Because I get paid a hip and off the day. And the second person said, I'm helping build that wall behind me. And the third person said, I'm helping build a great cathedral. And when it is over, people are going to come from all over the world and they will be inspired. And I will have had a small role to play in that. And the third one was the only one to recognize the architect. So I said, truth be told, I don't like doing it. It's backbreaking work, labor and I can get better wages for less effort. I'm only doing it because I want to learn. Will you teach me to build a cathedral? 20 years from that day, the guy who was breaking rocks was dead. He no longer had strength to swing a hammer. He starved. The guy who was helping build the wall behind him was living a life of desperate poverty. But the guy who was helping build a cathedral was on his way to building his first cathedral. And that is a choice each one of us has every day. We can get up in the morning and we can break rocks. Or we can get up in the morning and help building a cathedral. I cannot define for you the cathedral that you're building. You're the only person who can do that. But I can tell you that unless you find and define for, your, for yourself the cathedral that you're building, you're going to live an essentially mediocre life punctuated with flashes of pleasure. That's just the way it works. Are you happy? Most people will say yes. But as I mentioned earlier, there's always that undercurrent of tension, of anxiety, of the feeling that I could have accomplished so much more and I have not succeeded. So what do you need to get in order to be happy? I've used this exercise in many top business schools and persons always come up with a big list of things and topping all of those are vast wealth and trophy spouse. And the notion is that if I get all of these things, then I will be happy. Wrong. 
There is nothing that you have to do, get, or be in order to be happy. Happiness is hardwired inside you. It's part of your innate nature. So some of you may be thinking, if happiness is my innate na nature, and if happiness is hardwired inside me, how come I'm not experiencing my innate nature? How come I'm experiencing my life sucks? And the short answer is we believe in the if-then model. And the if-then model basically states, if this happens, then I will be happy. And for members of this audience, the principal way in which you are different, apart from your physical characteristics and so on, is what is the particular if-then model that you believe in? If only my salary increased, if only I had a bigger house, if only the pandemic would go away so I can travel, if only my in-laws would move to Australia, if only my son would get into one of the IIMs, if only my son would get into one of the IIMs and my neighbor's son didn't make it to any of them. If this happens, then I will be happy. The if-then model is fundamentally broken, but we never recognize that the model is broken. We think that we put the wrong thing on the if side of the equation. And what we have to do is put the right thing and then we will be happy. So thus, I thought if I got married, I would be happy. I now recognize I married the wrong person. I have to extricate myself from this with as little financial damage as possible, marry the right person, and then I will be happy. Wrong. It's not what you put on the if side of the equation. It's the model itself that's broken. We think the if-then model works because many times we wanted something, we got it, and we felt happiness. Actually, what happened is it's not that we got what we want and therefore we became happy, but we got what we wanted and for a very brief time before the next want raised its head, we were in a stage when we were perfectly content with what we had. We didn't want anything. And when we were in that space of complete acceptance of the universe, our habitual wanting self was not there temporarily, and the happiness, which is an innate part of us, surfaced, and we could experience it in its fullness. And I'm suggesting to you right now that your life, with all of the problems you have, your life with all of the problems you think you have, is every bit as perfect. But you're striving with might and main to resist one or more parts of it. And in that resistance, you're buying into the if-then model. And that is why we live our lives full of tension. The way around that is to invest in the process. Do not invest in the outcome. Here's how we tend to live our life. I set a goal for myself. I tried very hard to reach it. I succeeded, life's a blast. I set a goal for myself. I tried very hard to reach it. I fail, life sucks. We live a life oscillating on a sinusoidal curve between elation and despair, and we spend more time on the despair end of the spectrum. It's a lousy way to live. There is an alternative, a very powerful alternative. Invest in the process. Do not invest in the outcome. Set a goal for yourself. Set an ambitious goal for yourself. But once the goal has been set, forget about it. That's right. Forget about it. Don't give it another thought. The importance of a goal is that it establishes the direction in which you want to move. Once that has been established, instead pour all of your energy into one of the actions that I have to undertake in order to meet my goal. And pour yourself into that. When you do that, two things happen. One, you'll actually begin to enjoy what you're doing. And number two, the probability that you will get to the goal you wanted actually increases. That's right. When you are detached from your goal, when if you accomplish it, fantastic. If you don't accomplish it, fantastic. The probability you will actually accomplish it increases. The benefit of setting a goal is not achieving the goal. That's where we make a fundamental mistake. The benefit of setting a goal is achieving the goal. 
The principal benefit of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is the learning and growth that happen in you and to you as you try your level best to achieve the goal. If you actually achieve the goal, that is a bonus. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened, so you're ahead of the game. It's a no-lose proposition. The purpose of washing dishes is not to get them clean. The purpose of washing dishes is to wash the dishes. This is a very powerful and profound saying. We are always doing something in order to do something else. And when that something else happens, we do something else to get to someplace else. It's a lousy way to live life. When you're washing dishes, feel the detergent on your hands, feel the warm water, feel your dishes uh, as you uh, soap them with, as you uh, put apply detergent and rinse them. And in the process of doing that, the dishes do become clean but you are washing dishes. You're not trying to get them clean. And you can use that as a motto, as a blueprint for your life. Yes, you have great goals to accomplish, but what you're doing is you're focusing on the immediate task at hand. And as you focus on the immediate task at hand, your ultimate objective will in fact be uh, reached if... uh, you know, that was your lot in life. And if it doesn't, the learning growth happen. But most important, you're enjoying life this minute. And this minute is all you have. In a very real sense, each day is your life in miniature. You're born when you get up in the morning. You die when you go to bed at night. And in between is the time you have. And you can fret and fume or you can simply be and enjoy it. And if you enjoy each day, you'll find that your life takes care of itself. So here is something for you to think of. Are you happy, deliriously happy right now? If not, what is the if-then model you're holding on to that is preventing you from experiencing that joy which is innate in you? There was a study done which showed that the number one reason persons are not happy is because their mental chatter is constantly taking them to different places. So practice mindfulness. Meditation is a wonderful thing if you can set up a regular meditative practice. Focus your mind on your task at hand. Here's a visual analogy. Imagine an hourglass. There's some sand in the bulb above, there's some sand in the bulb below, and one grain of sand at a time goes through the neck. That grain of sand is the task at hand. Focus on that and only on that. Be grateful. Don't be grateful for something, just be grateful. Our awareness is like a flashlight. A flashlight shines up whatever you shine, illuminates whatever you shine it on. And we have the habit of shining the flashlight of our awareness on the things which are wrong in our lives, more precisely in the things which we have arbitrarily defined are wrong with our lives. And we completely ignore the 40, 50, or 200 things that are pretty good about our lives. Do you have a bed to sleep in? A roof over your head? Food to eat? Any one of these is a big deal for a big chunk of the world's population, right? So when I point this out, you recognize that you're very privileged, but you don't feel very privileged. You feel put upon and stressed out. And the reason for that is where you shine the flashlight of your awareness on. Shine it on the many things which are good in your life and keep it there. It is my hope that you will live in a default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude. Because when you're in a default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude, you're not anxious, you're not stressed out, you're not angry. The two cannot coexist. Laugh. My earnest recommendation is read a novel by P.J. Woodhouse every month. In my opinion, he's one of the greatest humorists who ever lived. And uh, it is 
part of my personal goal to convert as many people to PG Woodhouse as I possibly can. <clears throat> Let me share another extremely powerful exercise. And this is our, and this has to do with our habit of labeling anything that happens to us. And whatever happens to us, we instantly label it either as good or bad, or slightly good or slightly bad. Nothing's ever neutral. So you go to the coffee machine and you find that uh, there is only the dregs left. And if you want to have a cup of coffee, you've got to rinse it out and brew a fresh cup. This is bad. Your partner calls and says your in-laws are coming for uh, dinner and they may stay the weekend. This is really bad. Think about how no matter what happens in your life, in your head, there is that flicker of thought and you immediately say this is good or this is bad. Now understand something. An event by itself never causes suffering. Suffering only happens when you decide that this event is bad. It is terrible. You can't bear it. You get fired from your job. Okay, you now have a lot of spare time. But you get fired from your job and you go, oh my God, what's going to happen to my income? How will I pay the rent? This is bad. And the moment you say this is bad, at that instant, suffering begins. Now, can you recall any instance in your life when something happened that at the time it happened, you thought this was terrible, but you could now look back upon it and say, this was wonderful? Probably, most people can. I remember I was speaking before the Global Executive Summit of the Entrepreneurs' Organization. Somebody at the back raised his hand and wanted to be acknowledged, so I did. And he said, Professor Rao, I've got a perfect example from you. He had graduated from one of the IITs and he went to Stanford, did his master's. He got a job with a high-tech company. He was looking forward to building his career along with his, those of his friends who had got jobs at other high-tech companies. But he had an immigration problem as a result of which he was forced out of, out of the country. And he thought his life was over or ruined. Among other things, he had student debt. And when you have student debt in uh, dollars and you're earning in rupees, it's not a very happy place to be in. But he said, Professor Rao, as a result of that, I met this wom woman, this wonderful lady who's now my wife. I teamed up with a bunch of my, with a couple of my engineering college buddies and we started a company. It's going gangbusters. All my clients are in America. I come to America at least six times a year. I'm living a picture perfect life and none of this would have happened if I had not been forced out. So ask yourself, when something happens and you're about to label this is bad, ask yourself, can I visualize any scenario by which this could turn out to be good rather than bad? Merely asking yourself that question will move you to a different emotional domain. And if you then ask yourself the next question, is there anything I can proactively do to actually make this good? And you move seamlessly from the realm of despair to the realm of possibility. This is an immensely powerful exercise, so think about it and practice it immediately. Is it true that what I'm about to label bad is bad? Is there any way in which it could be a wonderful thing? And can I do anything to make it a wonderful thing? And you'll find that it completely transforms your view of adversity. This is how you become not just resilient, but extremely resilient. You never have to overcome adversity because you never had adversity to begin with. Einstein said the most important question you will ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Most of us live in a universe which is neither friendly nor unfriendly. It is indifferent and uncaring. Here I am going about doing my thing. There's the universe going around doing its thing. Sometimes it seems to help me. Sometimes it seems to thwart me. But essentially, it's indifferent. Well, what if the universe was aware of your existence and the universe was friendly? Friends don't shaft friends, do they? Of course not. So why does the universe give you stuff you don't want? You want to travel on vacation, the universe gives you pandemics and lockdown. You want to grow your business and your customers are deserting you. Why does the universe give you stuff you don't want? Well, what if the universe gives you stuff you don't want, but it's exactly what you need it for your learning and growth? It's like you're a small child and you want a tub of ice cream and the universe 
in the form of your parents gives you fruits and vegetables. And you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream, but the universe gives you fr fruits and vegetables. And it isn't only until you have a different level of maturity and wisdom that you can say, thank God, I got fruits and vegetables. What if the universe was friendly? What if it gave you exactly what you needed, which might not be what you wanted, but it's exactly what you needed? Try cultivating the notion that you live in a friendly universe and your experience of life will improve immeasurably. As you go through life, be a civil engineer. If a civil engineer has to build a road and where the road has to go, there is a forest, a mountain, and a swamp. Does the engineer get angry at the forest, the mountain, and the swamp? Of course not. That's the terrain that he or she has been given. And her skill as a civil engineer lies in determining how to get the road built. Do you go over the obstacle, under it, around it, through it? In exactly say, the same way, all of the problems you're confronting, all of the problem persons in your life that you rail against, they are the forests, the mountains, and the swamp. You don't get angry at them. You just figure out how you're going to get your road built, your road to a meaningful, purposeful existence where you feel joy every day. There's a wonderful tale from the Native American tradition which talked about talks about a young man who's about to take his position with the adults of the tribe, and the final rite of passage is a conversation with the medicine man. And the medicine man says, here is this dog, kind, loving, intelligent, trustworthy, and here's the wolf, malevolent, vicious, cruel, ready to snap at and kill anything. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you, and the dog and the wolf are fighting. And the young man asks, which one's going to win? And the medicine man says, whichever one you feed. Think about it. Inside each one of you is a altruistic, let's help each other and make the world a better place feeling. And inside each one of us is also, let me grab everything I can for myself and the devil take the hindmost feeling. And the two are constantly fighting. It's your job to find and feed the dog in you. It's also your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in everyone around you. Very often we feed the wolf and we don't even know we've done that. Say you go to the coffee machine, you're having a bad day at work, and your colleague comes and says, I'm having a bad day at work. And you say, you're having a bad day at work. Let me tell you about my bad day at work. And your bad day at work tops his bad day at work, and you go off feeling smug. You just fed the wolf with both yourself and the other person. If instead you'd gone, you're having a bad day, I'm having a bad day, what can we collectively do to make sure that nobody ever has a bad day like that again? And now you started feeding the dog. So in every conversation you have with every person, with your spouse, with your children, with your colleagues, with the Uber driver who takes you to the airport, ask yourself, am I feeding the dog? Am I feeding the wolf? Am I doing, saying, behaving in a manner that leaves that person feel better about his or her circumstances, more positive about life and moving upwards or am I pushing him or her into a downward emotional vortex? Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? This is a long journey. I've shared many concepts with you and implementing them is really a rest of your life project. And it's a long journey ahead of you. Let me conclude by sharing a very powerful video it encapsulates a wonderful approach to life. We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face and sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed the story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning and they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless, except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm going to do something about the fire. So it flies to the nearest stream 
takes a drop of water and he puts it on the fire and goes up and down, up and down, up and down as fast as it can. In the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals like the elephant with a big trunk could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless and they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small, you can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I am doing the best I can. And that to me is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. And that is a wonderful way to live life. Be like a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. I have some time for questions, Bhavna. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao, for that deeply insightful talk. There's a lot for us to take in from that, a lot for us to process. As you said, it's a long journey. Um, we do have a lot of questions from our community. Here's one. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? It's a powerful idea of not judging anything in that moment because you don't know how it might turn out. But what would you say to to people who are dealing with grief or loss at this time or are helping others deal with grief or loss, um, how do you not be judgmental in, in, in that, at that time in your life and not be impacted by what has happened? Uh, that is an excellent question, Pavna, and, uh, and I've come across this many times. As human beings, we are so strongly conditioned that there are some things that we are simply not capable of labeling. Perhaps it's a good thing. On a personal level, it could be tragedy like serious illness or death, particularly if you have death of a small child, for example. On a historical basis, it could be the big uh, tragedies like the Holocaust, uh, the partition of India, you know, the Bengal famine, things of that nature. So don't try to say perhaps it's good because you can't kid yourself and that's not there. What you can do is you can say, at my present level of spiritual growth and awareness, I cannot think of this as anything apart from a great tragedy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it up in cellophane and put it on the shelf and say it is a great tragedy and perhaps someday I will grow to a level where I can understand the deeper significance and meaning. But until then, it is a tragedy. But what I can do is I can decide that I'm not going to let my life be defined by this tragedy. So I will grieve appropriately, then I will use that tragedy for the benefit of myself and others. And if you think about it, how many movements, wonderful movements, have arisen as a result of tragedy. Think about organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving or Sisters Against Drunk Driving, which were caused by you know, women who had children who were lost in, uh, to, in drunk driving accident. The organization which was formed to combat landmines, which won the Nobel Prize recently, was formed because uh, the uh, person who started that lost a child to a landmine. So there are many ways in which tra tragedies have actually seeded movements, things that led to great good thereafter. Maybe this is part of it. I'm going to try and see what I can do from this tragedy. I remember that in one of my programs, there was uh, my assistant who had lost a close family member, her brother, 
And the speaker was the CEO of a a uh, fortune 50 company who had lost a son tragically and the fact that they had this experience of loss was a bond between them and she asked him how can you say it was a good thing and the ceo thought for a while and he said i cannot classify it as a good thing but i can say that as a result of what i went through i can relate to other persons who have suffered a loss at a level that i was never able to before so live with that it is a tragedy you can't define it as not a tragedy but you can decide you will not let your life be defined by that tragedy yes very true um here is another question that's come up in in various forms you talk a lot about mental models and even your talk today was about replacing a lot of models that are not helping us with ones that can help us problem with our mental models is they tend to be very very sticky we've built them over time they're deeply entrenched in our minds uh what would you say is one of the most effective dare i say fast ways of replacing our mental models or taking on a new mental model okay i can give you a method which is very effective in fact not not only is it very effective but it absolutely will work it is not necessarily fast because some mental models you can replace very 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 quickly and some mental models are so deeply embedded that it'll take a very very long time for you to replace it and the thing that you have to do is be constant and persistent you know a stream of water can wear away the hardest rock so you have to apply constant gentle pressure that's the mantra constant gentle pressure keep reminding yourself of the mental model remind yourself that it is a mental model by the way just recognizing that your mental model is a mental model is a huge step forward most people never even get to that stage not only do they not recognize that they have mental models they don't even know that they have mental models they think this is reality and all of the prejudices we have are mental models you know persons of ex religion are violent persons from white part of the country are uh, lazy all the stereotypes we have they're all mental models if we recognize that they are mental models that's already a huge step forward and the best way to combat that is to look for examples that count contradict your mental models and if you look for examples that contradict your mental models and dwell upon them you come to the point you know maybe this is not true and i need to go back to the drawing board but this is a process you have to do over and over and over again because what we've done most of our life is we've surrounded ourselves with people who reinforce the mental models we already have and we reinforce theirs so we live in a self-fulfilling bubble and that is something we have to make a conscious decision to break out of absolutely true thank you so much uh, dr rao for sharing your precious time with us and your deeply transformational wisdom I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say your words are immensely uplifting especially at this time and I do hope after many of the ideas you've shared with us today we can all move forward with a lot more resilience a lot more hope and um a lot more happiness as well yes so each day is precious bhavna so live each day make it the best day of your life and your life will take care of itself just focus on this day very true thank you dr bhavna it's been my pleasure entirely and i wish you a terrific what well, less of the evening and a wonderful rest of your life thank you so much i we will all wish the same for you thank you